We got all that. Well, good morning, everyone. We uh, come to the end of a new, uh, uh, not a new series, but the, it was a new series when we started, a five-part series called Forward, based on the book by Dr. David Jeremiah. And I just want to say to you, if you haven't got that book, there's still some in our bookstore. You ought to get one of those. I also want to say we've got Daryl Strawberry's new book, that every man in America ought to get a copy of that book. And to read it, I want to encourage you. I also want to say, did you see that promo up there? We've been using that promo for this last series, and there's kind of a subliminal suggestion there who I think is going to win the Super Bowl. So I just want to throw that in up front so everybody knows uh, before we go. Uh, take your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, I'll be there in a moment. You know, if you ever get in trouble and you need a good attorney, you might want to hire Frank Luciana. He's a razor-sharp attorney in Hackensack, New Jersey, just across the Hudson from the New York City. You can spot him in the courtroom. He's dressed in a dapper suit with a pocket square, chopping his hands in the air, defending people in trouble, and he does it with energy and effectiveness. Luciana's been defending clients for quite a while. Forty-five years ago, in fact, a local newspaper claimed he was the city's busiest criminal lawyer. 22 years ago, the same paper called him a consummate showman and New Jersey's oldest active attorney. Today, Luciana still waxes eloquently before judges and juries at the age of 97. And he's not resting on his laurels. He said, and I quote, this is a very consuming profession. It has taken a lot out of my life. I am constantly involved in preparing cases, and it's a tremendous strain, both mental and physical. Physical, because when you go to trial on a case, your whole being is obsessed with trying to help the person you represent, and it places your body and mind under tension. When he was asked about his future, Luciani, Luciana said, I hope God lets me continue doing this. I don't want to retire. I don't want to go to Florida. I just want to do what I'm doing. Now, there's a guy who wants to finish well. John Acuff wrote a book several years ago called Give Yourself the Gift of Done. In it, he explains how hard this is for some people. He said of himself, I've only completed 10% of the books I own. It took me three years to finish six days of the P90X home exercise program. <laughs> Which, why in the world would anyone ever want to do that? I've never figured that out. Uh, he said, when I was 23, I made it to Blue Belt in karate. I have 32 half-started moleskin notebooks in my office and 19 tubes of nearly finished chapstick in my bathroom. He went on to say he's clearly not the only one who doesn't stick with things. He said, according to studies, 92% of New Year's resolutions fail. Every January, people start with hope and hype, believing this will be the new year that does indeed deliver a new you. But although 100% start, only 8% finish. 8%. I won't ask for a show of hands. Dr. J. Robert Clinton, a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, has devoted vast amounts of time to researching the lifelong leadership development of people in the Bible. David Jeremiah said as part of his study, he identified about a thousand men and women in the Bible who were considered leaders, national leaders, Jewish leaders, church leaders, patriarchs, priests, kings, and so forth. He said there are only 49 prominent leaders in Scripture whose lives were surveyed as a whole. In other words, we know how they started, we know how they finished. Of these 49, only 30% finished well. The other 70% fell short of God's plan for their lives, a fact that should jolt us. 
Some leaders, such as Samson and Eli, stumbled at midlife. Others, such as Noah, David, Jehoshaphat, and Hezekiah, stumbled near the end. But thank God for the 30%, Dr. Jeremiah said, for people like Joshua and Daniel, Peter and Paul, who enjoyed walking with God in increasing intimacy throughout their days. They simply kept growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. They remain yielded to him in all things, like the trees planted in the courtyard of the Lord that Psalm 92 talks about. They flourished and stayed fresh and green, bearing fruit whatever their age, end quote. Our text today is 2 Timothy chapter 4, and in these verses we hear from a gentleman at the end of his life, and we hear his testimony of a well-lived Life. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word? 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. Paul says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter if you've fought a good fight or finished the race if you don't keep the faith. Somewhere along the line, you know, I've watched people for years, you know, who, men who have preached and people who've been faithful to God, and they come to the end of their life, and somehow it's like a a switch goes off, and all of a sudden, well, I don't go to church anymore. I don't pray anymore. I don't go, I don't believe in God anymore. Listen, friend, that's not the way you want to end. You know the way you want to end, at least the way I want to end? I want to be running for the tape. I want people to be shocked how, how I ran for the tape all the way to the end. Finish well. He said, I've kept the faith. Because of that, he says, henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. It's not a reward just for apostles. It's a reward for faithful Christians who have fought the good fight, finished the race, and kept the faith all the way to the end. You may be seated, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, I know some of you are probably saying, well, those are great words, pastor. But Paul was an old guy. He was at the end of his life, and I am nowhere near his age. So what's that got to do with me? Everything. If you and I ever hope to finish right and finish strong, there are some specific things we need to be doing right now. Obviously, the greatest finisher in the Bible is Jesus. In John 4, 34, he said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. In John 5, 36, he said, For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. You remember his last three words from the cross? John 19, verse 30, It is finished. He wasn't 97 like Frank Luciana, nor was he like Paul at the end of a long life. He was only 33. And that ought to get our attention. You say, you and I, we may may finish long before others do, or, or maybe many years to come. There's no way to know. Nobody knows. But there are some specific things that every one of us should be doing right now, no matter what age, no matter what stage of life, so we can finish well. David Jeremiah said, and I quote, the best expenditure you'll ever make is the legacy of a well-invested life. And by the way, he's not talking about Wall Street. He's not talking about GameStop or Tesla. You say, well, what are the best investments you and I can make? There are three of them, three specific investments every one of us can make. Here's the first one. Invest in God's Word. Psalm 119, verse 89 says, your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. If you want to invest in something that will benefit you forever, invest in the Word of God. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, number one, you need to spend time in His Word. David Jeremiah said, the time you spend in God's Word is an investment in both eternal and internal wisdom. 
He's saying there are benefits for the life to come forever, but there are benefits right now. And we need those benefits. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. We're not long for this world, folks. We're like grass. We're like flowers. So we better invest in something that's going to last forever. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. You know, you can always tell when someone's spending time in the Word of God. You can. So how can you tell? Well, they walk by faith and not by fear. They live according to the promises of God instead of the problems of the world. They exude joy and enthusiasm. By the way, that word enthusiasm comes from two words, in theos, which literally means in God. The more time you spend in God and in God's Word, the more enthusiastic you're going to be. You're down in the dumps, a little negative, pessimistic. Oh, life's horrible, whatever. Act like you're baptized in dill pickle juice. (laughs) Spend some time in God's Word and watch what happens. You get in God's Word and you let God get in your life, and suddenly there will be an enthusiasm about your life. Invest in God. Spend time in God's Word. But, but, but listen, it's not, it's not enough just to spend time in God's Word. Number two, we have to study His Word. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 to his young son in the faith, Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the Word of truth. You know what Paul was showing Timothy? You need to spend time in God's Word. You need to study it so you can know it. You can handle it the right way. When you stand up and share it with others, you can be telling them the truth. Not what you think it means. You know, there's too many people. That's their their idea of Bible study. Well, here's what that verse means to me. I don't want to know what that verse means to someone else. I want to know what that verse means if you never lived. What did God intend? You say, well, pastor, is is there a way to know that? Yes but only with diligent study and careful discipline. You can know what God's Word says. It takes time. It takes work. It takes effort. But it's worth everything to make sure we know God's Word. We need to study God's Word. We need to spend time in God's Word. We need to study God's Word. But listen, studying God's Word is not enough either. Number three, we need to spread His Word. You know, if all we do is acquire knowledge we run the risk of becoming arrogant and puffed up. Have you ever known people like that? They know enough of the Bible to be obnoxious. You know, they don't live it, they don't apply it, but they know all these verses and know all the whatever. No, listen, if, if all we do is a, acquire knowledge, that's a waste of time. I mean, who wants to be a, a, a know-it-all who's a walking, talking encyclopedia of foolishness and arrogance? That kind of person doesn't bless anyone. If our knowledge of the Word of God doesn't lead us to share what we've learned with others so they can know God, we become nothing more than well-educated fools. And when we come to church and listen to a message about God's Word, if all we do is take notes or mumble an occasional amen, or I'm with you, and we never share it with anybody else to help them, if we don't apply it to our lives, we're wasting our time. We need to spend time in God's Word. We need to study God's Word. We need to spread His Word. So the the first investment, the first major investment we all should be making right now, regardless of what age or stage of life we're in, is to invest in God's Word. Here's number two. We need to invest in God's work. Dr. Jeremiah said that leads to another step in God's strategy. Let's invest our time and abilities in His work on earth. The work of God is eternal. We'll still be serving Him in heaven, Revelation 22, verse 3. His enterprise will never go bankrupt. His servants will never be laid off. We're to serve Him as best we can until our last breath, and then we'll pick up where we left off and keep serving Him in heaven. God's work will never go out of business. You say, well, how can I... How can I invest in God's work? Let me give you two two ways, two specific ways 
you can invest in God's work. Number one, develop a personal ministry. Develop a personal ministry. Now, I'm not talking about your occupation. I'm talking about your vocation. Your occupation is what you do for a paycheck to enable you to fulfill your vocation, your, God's calling on your life. You do understand if you're in real estate that, 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 and you're a Christian that, that you're not in real estate to sell houses. You do understand that, right? You do understand that God's just gifted you in that area of life so that when you sell houses, you can witness of His grace and His love to those you're showing those houses to and those you're interacting with, and that enables you to earn an income so you can fulfill your vocation, which is bringing people to Him. You do realize that. You do realize if you're a school teacher that that's your occupation. That's not your vocation. You're a school teacher to teach the young hearts and minds of, of young people so they can understand how things work in the world and all that, but you're really there to be able to give an influence and a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word, and that enables you to have a salary so you can fulfill your vocation, what God has called you to do. It doesn't matter what your occupation is. All that does is provide you the wherewithal to fulfill your vocation, your ministry. What is your personal ministry. Jesus set the standard for all of us in Matthew 20, verse 28, when He said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. Listen, if we're going to live well and we're going to finish well, we can't be consumers. We need to be contributors. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but the what's in it for me crowd never contributes to the needs of others. It's all about them. They never help anybody else. They're not interested in building God's kingdom. They're too interested in building their own. By the way, we'll see in a moment why that's a complete waste of time. David Jeremiah said, quote, do you know how many ways we can serve? At least 7.7 billion, because that's the estimated population of earth, and every person has a need. He also said, God hasn't placed you on earth for a few fleeting decades to serve yourself, but primarily to serve Him and those He brings near you. He has given you a unique set of gifts and talents. Your primary task here is to invest yourself in the personal ministry God has for you. So number one, devote yourself to a personal ministry. Develop a personal ministry. God has put me here for a purpose, and my purpose is to help people get to heaven. But number two, we can invest in God's work by devoting ourselves to a local church. Again, David Jeremiah said, when Christ returned to heaven, he left behind one and only one great organism for continuing his work, his church. And his church is eternal. It isn't made of bricks and mortar, but of human beings, living stones. We're his family, and he has made us part of the family business. I like that. Romans 12, verse 4 and 5 says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one in the body of Christ and individually members of one another. We belong to each other, and we belong together. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as, the habit, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now I want to ask you a question. Is the day drawing near? Oh yeah. We're closer now than we've ever been. So if the day is drawing near, we ought to be getting together with greater regularity. We ought to be stirring one another up to love and good works more than ever before because the day is approaching. You know, the church in the book of Acts, the first church, they did it right. And if we're going to do it right, it might be good for us to go back and see what they did. Turn back to Acts chapter 2, and beginning in verse 42, it tells us the secret of that first church. Listen to what Luke says. He said, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. 
And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, you know, some people have read that and they say, well, that's communism. I mean, it says they, they sold everything and everybody had everything in common. No, that's not communism. In fact, if you read farther down, it says, and they continued to meet in their own homes. They didn't give up their homes. No, what they did was people gave from the overflow. People gave from the extra that they had to make sure that those who had nothing had something. They really cared about people who had needs. And they devoted themselves not only to the apostles' teaching, that's the word, the fellowship, that's worship, the breaking of bread, that's the Lord's Supper, which we just observed here, and to prayer. They were enthusiastically devoted to those things, but they were enthusiastically devoted to each other. They wouldn't even think about getting out of their car and walking across the parking lot and not talking to somebody else yet, whether they knew them or not, on their way into church. But I'll bet some of you did. That doesn't mean you did what was wrong. What it means is on your way out, you might want to say, wasn't that a great service today? Didn't the pastor nail it today? Isn't he awesome? No, I'm not. not that's a joke. Don't have to say that. Don't have to say that. I'm just joking. They were devoted to each other. Dr. Jeremiah continues. He said, there's no better investment of a person's time, money, attention, and energy than in the local church. It was designed in the creative genius of Jesus Christ and is his, orda- is his ordained channel of redemption in the world. Don't be afraid to invest yourself in it. It is God's chosen instrument to take the gospel to the world, the church. And so my question is, are you fully invested, fully involved, fully devoted to a local church? If not, why not? And if not now, when? And can I say to those of you, if Crossroads is your church home, you know what that means. You need to be all in, all the time, devote yourself fully to the church and to every, everyone who's a part of it. And if Crossroads is not your church, like those who are watching online, you need to find a Bible-believing church. You need to jump in with both feet and give it all you got. Because it's the greatest institution on the face of the earth, ordained by God, instituted by Jesus. He said, I'll build my church, and the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. There's something about the church. And we need to invest in God's work, in God's church. So number one, invest in God's word. Number two, invest in God's work. Here's one more. Number three, invest in God's wealth. So what do you mean by that? Dr. Jeremiah said, and I quote, having invested ourselves in God's word and God's work, we have to make sure we're investing in God's wealth. In the rich, endless, and lavish future, he has laid up for us in heaven. You know, Jesus said the same thing. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 20, Jesus said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to invest carefully. We need to invest carefully. I know something about every one of you in this room, and it's great to see so many people here on Super Bowl Sunday morning. This is awesome. But I know something about every one of you. I I know how every single one of you came into this world. You know how you came into this world? Naked and with nothing in your hands. Every one of us. And I also know how every single one of us is going to leave. Now, some other folks are going to dress us up. And doesn't that bother you a little bit? Think about, well, you know, I'm not sure, whatever. By the way, you can write all the stuff down you want. This is what I want done, all that. And you got to know that the people left behind, they're going to go, well, he didn't really mean that. <laughs> he said he wanted to be ba- buried in his swimsuit. You know, his, what I was told, his greatest wish of his life. What? That's what he said. Well, that's not what he wrote, but that's what he meant. Listen, I've watched families do that for years. But you'll still not have anything in your hands. That's the reality of life. 
And that's why we need to be careful. We don't invest our time, our effort, our energy, and our resources in things that aren't going to last. Everything that you and I can see right now is one day going to be burned up. That's what 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 says. The whole earth and everything in it is going to be one massive ball of fire, all burned up. So why is it going to be burned up? God's purifying this place so there'll be a new earth. There'll be a new heaven, a new earth, and only those who've experienced the new birth will get to come back and be a part of it. So that tells me two things. Number one, you want to be saved, and number two, you want to be investing in stuff that's going to last forever, not stuff that's going to burn up. I had a fellow tell me one time, he was a pastor of a very large church, good friend of mine, mentor of mine. He said, do you know in the business world how many millions of dollars you could make every year? I said, that doesn't interest me one bit in the least. Because what I'm doing is eternal. It's not temporal. What shall a profit a man, the Bible says? Jesus said, if a man shall gain the whole world, lose his own soul. Don't invest in the wrong things. Don't spend all your time, effort, energy, and resources pouring into stuff that's going to be burned up. That's a mistake. Need to invest carefully. But we also need to invest eternally. Jesus said in Luke 16, 9, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. In other words, use the money that what's in your wallet, what's in your pocketbook, what's in your bank account, what, wherever you have money. Use that to help, help get people to heaven. And when you get there, there's going to be a bunch of people there, some of them you never knew, who are going to come and say, I, I'm in heaven because of you. I'm in heaven because you supported that church. I'm in heaven because you gave to that missionary. I'm in heaven because you, 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 you helped with that program that reached young people, and those people reached people. We don't know how God's going to use it, but we know God's going to use it. And you're going to reap what you sow. We want to invest eternally. Invest in the work of getting people to heaven, whatever that means. I like what Randy Alcorn said. Remember when Randy Alcorn was here back a couple years ago in August, and, and he was on our platform, and, and I, never, I never ever imagined that the services would be the way they were. There was, there was just a touch of eternity on them. You know why? Because we were talking about heaven. And there was a joy that came over all the people that were there that day because we were talking about what's heaven going to be like, and it was just amazing to be a part of that. Listen to what he says. He said, Christ offers us the incredible opportunity to trade temporary goods and currency for eternal rewards. By putting our money and possessions in his treasury while we're still on earth, we assure ourselves of eternal rewards beyond comprehension. Consider the implications of this offer. We can trade temporal possessions we can't keep to gain eternal possessions we can't lose. This is like a child trading bubble gum for a new bicycle, or a man offered ownership of the Coca-Cola company in exchange for a sack of bottle caps. Only a fool would pass up the opportunity. If we give instead of keep, if we invest in the eternal instead of the temporal, we store up in heaven treasures that will never stop paying dividends. Whatever treasures we store up in heaven will be waiting for us when we arrive. That's a great quote. Now, here's the bottom line. Jesus said we can't take it with us, but we can send it on ahead. You say, Pastor, how do we do that? We invest in God's Word. We invest in God's work. We invest in God's wealth. And we invest carefully. And we we invest eternally. And if we move forward doing what God has called us to do, not only will we finish well, but we'll also have a life worth living right now. A life that will leave a well-invested legacy. Listen to these words of the psalm. Psalm 71, verse 18. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Now, we don't know who wrote that psalm. It could be David. Many have, have, have... guessed or speculated that it was David because Psalm 70 was written by David. So so Psalm 71, wouldn't that be written by David? It could have been that David got to the end of his life and he said, God, God, when I'm old and gray, 
You know, just l- let me have the opportunity to pass on to all who are coming behind me what's really important and what an awesome God you are. Could have been him. Others have speculated with Samuel. Samuel had the school of the prophets. Remember that? All the young preachers, all the young prophets. And he was saying, listen, God, even when I'm old and great, don't forsake me. Don't, don't take me home yet. Let me, let me pass on to all these young preachers, these young prophets, what an awesome God you are and how they need to live, live their lives for you. Others have said, well, it was Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. Prophet. The, 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 the prophet whose heart was broken as God was broken oh, over what had happened in the world around him. And, and, and perhaps it was Jeremiah that said, even when I'm old and gray, don't, don't take me home yet until I've been able to declare your power to the generations behind me and make sure they know what a great God you are and, and how, how they ought to live their life. But you know, as I read that word, that verse, and I thought about the different people who, who, who could have said that, I thought about you and me. That's our verse. Think about it. That's our verse. God, um, don't, don't take me home yet until I've had the opportunity to tell everyone I can. What a great God you are. And how they need to live their lives. Let us live long enough, God. That ought to be the prayer of every heart, every person. Because here's the deal. We don't know whether it's going to be many more years or we don't know if it's going to be just a few hours. So we better be making the right investments. Let's pray.